Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, one thing um one thing I just wanted to point out and people that are in people that were in my CP 133 heard this last quarter, but not everybody, you know, was in my class last quarter. So uh, you might have noticed that I'm recording the lectures and I did this for the first time during 133 last quarter. And and the thing I just wanted to let you know is um, you know, I can't guarantee the the qualities of these videos. I'm I'm gonna put them on Canvas. In fact, I put the first two meetings on Canvas over the weekend. Um, but you see the dilemma is that to get the best resolution uh, video, I have to record to my computer because if I record to the cloud, um, if the internet connection is not that great, it affects the resolution. Also, if I um, upload to YouTube after I have it on my computer, that also can affect the resolution. Uh, but the trouble with um, just using what I record to my computer is that it doesn't caption. Like I either have to upload it to Zoom to get captions or I have to upload it to YouTube to get captions, at least automatically. I mean, I don't have enough days in my life to do it manually. <laughs> okay. uh, but anyway, I just wanted to put that out there that, um, you know, I'm going to post what I have, but, you know, if you miss a class, I, I don't have any control over, you know, how good the video is. It's, like I said, it depends on the link and, you know, that's out of my control. So, um, you know, we'll just have to go with whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I watched some of the other sections' videos, and the audio was like all distorted. I don't know if you realize that. Yeah, that happened one time last quarter, and it happened with meeting two, eight to eleven, my like early one. Yeah, and again, I I check the audio every time I start, so I don't know what happened. I mean, yeah. like I said, that happened one time, but but if it happens, um. You know, I can send you a link to the other section where you could probably just find it on YouTube. That's what you probably did. Yeah, there. I think ours was fine. Uh, so yeah, those other sections could have looked at ours. Yeah, it was just the morning one that day that for some reason the audio was out of garble. So, I mean, if it happens, I, I record for all my sections. So, I mean, if it happens for your section, you can try to find the other section on YouTube or you can send me an email and I can send you the link to it. Okay. But um, yeah, I just wanted to let you know. That the quality might not be the best, and there's just things out of my control that because see, I can't um post things that don't have captions because that violates uh the American Disability Lab, so I don't want to get sued. So if it doesn't have captions, I don't post it. Okay, so today um you're gonna learn how to build or model in Verilog or system Verilog. One of the components that's on this diagram that makes up the otter, namely, you're going to be building the program count. And before I talk about the program count, which I talked a little bit about already, but before I talk about it today, I just want to review some things from CP133 that you're going to need in order to build this uh, piece of hardware. So we're going to start with a mux. And MUX is short for multiplexer. And I'm sure that you talked about this in 133, uh, especially if you're one of my sections, right? Because the designs that we did in 133, most of them had a MUX involved. So here's uh, the symbol for a MUX. And I need to put another input at the start. So another input. So this MUX that I drew on the board has four inputs and one output, uh, one output. And that's true of all MUXs. Huh? MUXs have more than one input and they always have just one output. In 133, quite a few of the designs were a two to one where it had two inputs and one output. This is a four to one, four inputs, one output. You can have eight to one, 16 to one, and so on. So you got Four inputs here labeled zero to three, you have one output, and then we have this other input labeled SEL and stands for select. The select input. So who remembers how a MUX works? Who can tell us how a MUX works? 
Exactly. Yeah, this is called a select input because depending on what the select input is, that's going to determine which output or which input gets connected to the output. So the way I think of a MUX is that it's sort of like an electronic multi-position switch. Right? Like you have these different positions on a switch and a select line, select input determines which of those multiple inputs get connected to the one output. Okay. Um, now, since we have four inputs here to select from, how many bits am I going to need on that select input to choose from four different things? Two, right? Because, again, that goes back to uh, the number of values equals two to the number of bits. Right? So if I've got two bits, then I can get four values from it. Two bits, right? From three bits, I can get eight values, four bits, 16 values, and so on. Every time I add a bit, I double the number of values that represent those bits. So if we fill out a truth table just to show how this works, well, when the select bits are zero, well, that's going to connect input zero to the output. The output is just going to be whatever it's on input zero. And if this is a binary one, well, then input one will be the output. If this is a binary two, then input two at the output. And if this is a binary three, input three at the output. And this is true whether these are single bit, right? The way I have it drawn right now, because I don't have a number. And these are just a single bit input and a single bit output. But the same is true. This truth table is true no matter how many bits we have for the inputs and outputs. So, you know, if these inputs were 32 bits, and this output was 32 bits, it's the same truth table. Okay. All right. So, everybody remember how a MUX works? I can do the check mark here. Right. You're going to see a MUX is part of what you got to build for that program time. Okay, so now what the barrel log or system barrel log code would look like to model this box. Now, like I said in an earlier class, uh, when I teach 133, I teach system barrel log, and that's what I'm familiar with. I realize that some of you that took 133 with a different instructor learned barrel log, and that's fine to use, okay? But the examples that I do in class, I'm going to write as system barrel log. And then if you know barrel log, you'll just have to modify. You know, we've totally done. Okay. So, like with any module in Verilog or system, uh, system Verilog, when you start off with the module name. Um, now, I mentioned this earlier in the class. Uh, be descriptive with your name. Okay, both the module names and all the like with your inputs and outputs. So, just don't call it MUX. You know, like I'm calling this PC MUX. It's a MUX that's part of the program count. And also, like with your outputs and inputs, don't do what I did here. Don't just have out. You know, have something more descriptive. Same thing with input. And the reason for that is because you got a bunch of modules that make up that otter. And at the end, when it's all connected together and you're trying to get it to work and you're troubleshooting and you've got a timing diagram in your simulation that has like 50 signals. And if you've got everything ABC for your inputs and you know, all your outputs the same, you're you're just gonna go crazy because you won't know what this input goes. To. Right. So that's why you want to be descriptive with your input and output. Okay, so the next thing we would do here since uh on MUX is what kind of logic circuit? There's two broad categories of logic circuits. There's combinational and there's sequential. What type is the MUX? Is it combinational or is it sequential? Okay. It's combinational. How do we know? No clock. And why does a sequential have a clock? Like, what part of a sequential circuit needs a clock? Feedback. Say that again. Feedback. Oh well, feedback because feedback is what part? What part of a, a circuit that needs a clock? What's the main thing that a sequential circuit does? What is it? 
Say it again. Ah, uh, well, it can be synchronized. He uses registers. Registers. Clock. Yeah, you need a clock that does what? Stores. Stores data. That's it. That's what I was looking for. Right. Sequential circuits have memory. Stored data, registers, need a clock, all those things. Okay. But this is a must. Doesn't have memory, doesn't have a clock. So it's combination. So in system Verilog, you would write always underscore so much. It's a combinational uh, type logic. And then you would need a begin. Okay, now if you were in my 133 section, uh, we used if statements for a mux. And the main reason I had people in my 133 section use an if statement because the muxes there were just two to one. So it was very little code when you did a if statement. Plus, um, in 133, we had a decoder where uh, a decoder is a good device to use as an example, a first example of a case statement. Okay, but here in this class, for muxes, since we're going to have muxes that have more than just a couple of inputs, uh, we're going to use a case statement. Okay, so I want you to use a case statement for the mux. So a case statement, you start with case, and then you have parentheses. And what do we put inside the parentheses? What do you think we're going to do here? Because inside the parentheses goes a sensitivity variable, right? Where when that variable within the parentheses change it, that's when the keys get the value. So, yeah, we're going to put the select, that SEL. Right, because it's that input that, that, uh, that it's going to determine which input gets connected to the output. Right, so when the select changes, that's when we want it to get a value. Okay, so then uh, we just put our options here. So we just, we just got to put our uh, different possibilities of select values. So, uh, you know, we've got these four different values here and I'll start with uh, two tick mark. Now, you could put a B for binary and then put the two binary bits, right? Like put two tick mark B zero zero. Uh, but what I'm going to do here, just to be a little different, just to show you something you can do, I want to do this. Is I'm going to make it decimal instead of binary. So you still need a two tick mark because it's two bits. But if you want to show it as a decimal instead of a binary, you just put D and you just put a single decimal digit of zero. And you need a colon, and then you would just put what out is for that uh, select value, which is just going to be our in zero. Okay, now another very important thing. Notice I use an equal sign. And in Verilog, there's an equal sign to make an assignment. And there's also the arrow equal sign along with the, um, the arrow symbol here. And one's called blocking and the other one's called non-blocking. Okay, and there's a big difference between the two. Okay, and the best way to show the difference is with uh, a couple of examples. See, here we have code where first B is being assigned to A and then C is being assigned to B. Well, if you're using the blocking symbol, right, the equal sign, what this will model in Verilog or system Verilog is just a wire where A, B, and C are on that same wire. So if you do this, A is going to equal C. And if you make B equal to A, then you make C equal to B. Well, this model of the wire, so A is just equal to C. But if you use the non-blocking assignment, right? You use the arrow, it doesn't generate a wire. What it generates is circuitry in between A, B, and C. And that circuitry is the latch. We see with this code, A does not equal C. Because right? again, it's not a wire connecting all together. It's circuitry in between them. It makes them not equal. 
Okay, so this is very important because if you're modeling something like a MUX that's a combination of circuit, but in your code you use the wrong assignment, like if I were to put an arrow here, that's going to generate additional circuitry in that MUX. It's going to put a latch in there. And since it's combinational, we don't want a latch. Your latch is memory, right? We want a latch when we have a sequential circuit. Now, see, that's the difference, or that's a difference between this class and 133. In 133, the designs were relatively simple now. Some people did some really elaborate final projects, but the actual labs in 133 compared to this class are relatively simple or basic. And in 133, you could have a design where you made an error like this, you know, with the wrong assignment, and it created additional circuitry that should have been there, like a latch, and it still would have worked okay. Okay, because timing is not critical in 133. Timing is critical in this class. It's critical for that otter. So if you have any extra circuitry like latches anywhere, it's going to throw out the timing and your otter is not going to work. Okay, it could very well work. The module could very well work, but once you hook everything up together, it's not going to work because of the timing. Okay, so you have to be very aware of latches. Are statements inefficient at all, or does it not really make a difference in terms of memory usage? Yeah, you you can do this with an if statement. In fact, like I said, one thirty three in my classes, I had my students use an if statement for the muxes. Uh, but we're going to use an if statement for something else later, and just for variety, for one. Um, and also, I think when you have more inputs than just a couple with the MUX, the K statement looks cleaner than just a bunch of like else's, else's, you know. So anyway, yeah, just yeah, just use the case um, to the MUX. Okay, you'll see we use an if statement to get to the register out. So anyway, you would just now finish out your options, right? So you'd have like a two tick mark D1, and you know, the set line is one, you want L2 equal the input one, right? And then we need the other two options. And then what do we always end the case with? What option? There's a last option you always put in. Well, you you end it with an end case, you know, like end the case with an end case, but there's something that goes before the end case. That's your last option. Default, default, default. right? You always need a default. Right, in the default, you just made out into something and whatever you want. But you see, that's another way you can get a latch. If you have a case statement and you don't end it with the default, that can create a latch. Okay. But then, like someone said, after the default will be end case. And then you got to end this begin. And then you would end the mod. Okay. Now, another thing that can create a latch is let's say, let's say instead of four inputs, you had three inputs. Now, if you have three inputs, you still need two bits for the select, right? Because in order to select input two, you need one zero. But if in your case statement, you didn't have an option for that third input, that could cause a latch. So you would still want two tick mark D3 without equal to something. You know, you could make it, you know, another default value. Okay, but you don't want to leave it blank because if you leave it blank, that's like an undefined in the case and an undefined can create a latch. Okay. Well, would it not matter if the default, wouldn't the default catch it? If you have, didn't have a three case? Uh, that's a good question. I'm pretty sure I'd run into where it had a default. I didn't have an option for the case and I got a warning that a latch was created. Now, Bovado is funny. So, you know, maybe it could depend on the version. I have um, version 2020. Uh, one you know, a couple of years old. So I don't know. Have, I mean, have you tried that in experience? And I don't have a lot of experience with this. Okay. Yeah, there, there can be some differences between the versions, but this is the safest thing to do. I mean, you'll know if it works or not, because if it, if it doesn't work, like say um, you leave it out, like you said, it just has a default. Well, when it gets simulated, 
if you don't get a warning that a latch has been created, then you're okay. Yeah. Okay, so any questions about the MUX or anything uh, up to this point? Is everybody okay? What would be your default just for the future? Um, you just want to make it something maybe that's different than, well, well, can't be good. It's going to be something to clear. So um, I don't know. Does anyone have any good answer for default that you use? I, I was, I mean, for this case, I think if you wanted to like, fail in a very obvious way, you could just like concatenate selector with itself to be like really different looking. Okay, that's an idea. So, yeah, you can be creative with it. There's no like, um, like set things to make it. Uh, now, in, uh, in the otter, where you have 32 bits, and uh, how many hex characters is 32 bits again? I asked this before, do you remember? Yeah. Well, how would you figure it out? You got 32 bits, and you want to find out how many hex characters it takes to represent those 32 bits. You divide by four, right? Because each hex character represents four binary bits, right? So what some people do, if it's a 32-bit uh, data, for their default, they'll, they'll use dead dead. You know, D E A D A D. All those letters are hands, so right? It's kind of a funny thing for default, like dead oh. dead. So you know, you can get creative. Okay. So any any more questions up to this point? Yes. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about that's also from one thirty three is a register, right? Because you all talked about registers in one thirty three. In fact, what does a register do? Like, what is the main purpose of a register? Yeah, it stores data, right? Because registers are made up of what? It's a collection of what? Flip flops, exactly. So a register stores data. And it's made out of these flip flops, right? Because each flip flop can store a bit. And if you put a bunch of flip flops together, like you put eight flip flops together, now they can all together, they can store eight bits, right? So that's what a register does. It, it stores multiple bits. It's made out of multiple uh, flip-flops. So on a typical register, you'll have an input LD that stands for load. And what does RSP stand for? That's reset. Okay, what does um, this symbol mean? I talked about this, this little oh, triangle. Uh, well, it, it's part of a flip flop, but what input is it? Plus. Oh, did you say plus? Okay. Yes, yeah, plus. Yeah. Okay, then we have an input uh, for data here, and then we have an output. Again, in your designs, you're going to be more descriptive than in or out. It's just an example. That's why I'm not using descriptive inputs and outputs. All right, so let's say that uh, both load and reset are active high. And they're synchronous. And let's also say that this register is rising edge triggered. Right? Remember, you can have rising edge or falling edge, right? Rising edge is the zero to one transition, falling edge is the one to zero transition. Okay, so just to review how a register works, let's go through this, this truth table here. Now, note that this output of the register is initially zero, zero, one, one. Okay, so a time equal to zero, that's what is at the output of the register, the zero, one, one, or zero, zero, one, one. Okay, so let's look at this first line here. Okay, the first line of the truth table, reset is zero, so that means it's not active, right, because it's active high. Load is zero, so it's not active, because load is active high. This is the data at the input. And now, at the time of that zero to one transition of the clock, the rising edge, what is the output going to be? Zero, zero, one, one. Yes. And why is that? Because you didn't load anything and you need to load it, put memory on it. Right. We didn't load it and we did reset. Yeah. Right. Since both of these aren't active, the register is just going to keep what it had previously. See, that's when it's storing data. When it retains data from a previous time, that's storage of data. So if you're not resetting, you're not loading, you're saving. 
right? You're storing. So yeah, the help would just be what it was prior. Okay. All right, now let's look at the next line. The next line is reset one, so it's active. Load is zero, it's not active. This is our input. And now at the time of this zero to one transition of the clock, what is the output going to be? All zero, because it gets reset, right? Reset's active and it's synchronous. So remember, when something's synchronous, it's not enough just to be active. It's got to be active and you got to have the edge of the clock. Right, so at the time of this zero to one transition of the clock, the output's going to get reset. It's going to go all zeros. Okay, how about the next line? The next line resets not active, load is active, and now what's going to happen at the time of that one to zero or zero to one transition of the clock? Right, which means what? Right now, the output is going to equal what at the input. Of the register. That's when it gets loaded. So here's something that can be confusing. Okay. In hardware, when you have a load, that's the same as a write. Right? Because when it loads, it puts data into the register, right? But remember the instructions we talked about in the instruction set architecture for the auto, the ISA, those load instructions, right? Load word, load byte, load half word. That's a read. So you see the load and the instructions we read, get data from, right? In the instructions, our write is a store, okay? But in hardware, load is like a write. And then you'll see reads are reads. <laughs> in hardware, you'll have like read inputs when you're reading, okay? But that can confuse people, but that's just the way it is. They don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> I, I didn't decide those things, okay? All right, so let's do this last one now. If, if reset's active and load is active, right? They're both one. What's going to happen now at the time of the zero to one transition of the clock? What's the output going to be if both load and reset are active? Depends on which one's priority. Great. Exactly, right? It depends which one you make priority. You determine that in your, in your code, your very loud code. And what you want to do with all the modules that are in this order is you always want to make reset the high priority. Okay, reset's always the highest priority. So as long as you make reset priority over load, the you output's know, just going to get reset in a case like that. You know how this quarter you've got to come up with the test cases for, you know, when you're checking to see if your designs work, whether you know it's software or hardware. Well, this is what is meant by a fringe case, right? Because fringe cases are things where, you know, you wouldn't normally do it, but you want to make sure that if it's done, that you still get an expected output. So, you know, this would be a test case. Even though you wouldn't reset and load at the same time normally, you would still test that to see what happens if that's done. Okay, so like when you're thinking of what test cases you need, for any design, whether it's software or hardware, there's like two main things to think about. One thing to think about is, well, how does this thing work, right? What's the functionality of it? You know, make sure you have enough test cases where you're testing the functionality that it's operating the way it should. But then the other part of coming up with test cases is the fringe cases where now you're thinking, how can I break this thing? You know, this is, how can I break this thing? What if I make both these inputs both active, even though they shouldn't be? Okay, so that's the way you got to be thinking when you come up with your test cases. Okay, so that's a register. Now, a counter is just a register where it's output increments in binary, um, you know, by a certain amount. You, you have a question? Uh, how would you do the priority for again? I will show that coming up. Okay, okay, yep. Yeah, I'll show that when uh, we get to this, which we're at right now, unless there's questions. Are there any more questions about anything up to this point? All right, so now let me show you the system Verilog code for a register. Okay, so you're gonna have your module name. Okay, again, you gotta declare inputs and outputs like you always would. Okay, so now a register is what kind of 
logic circuit, combinational or sequential? Sequential, because it's got a clock, it's got memory, sequential. So in your uh, Verilog or system Verilog code, you start with what with system Verilog? You start with always underscore FF, and then you need to add a symbol. And then in parentheses, oh, we're going to make them um, in your otter. All your sequential circuitry is rising edge. Okay, so everything's going to be rising edge that's sequential. Okay. Whoops. So this is POS. So pause edge and then clock. I think I got that right. Do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just coming up because it would. You don't need another one of the async reset, right? You don't need another. Statement. Oh, right, right, yeah, because everything's synchronized. All right, then we put it again. Okay, so for the register, use an if statement. So this is how we make the reset priority is in our if statement, we put reset first. All right, we'll put load as the else if. Is priority handled in case statements as well? Is priority um, is the top case statement the priority over the next one? No, because select decides which one we go to, right? Oh, because each one's separate, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it's not the same in a in a case. Because you know, if the case is a a two, it's just going to jump to the two. You know, it just goes to whatever one the case is equal. Yeah. All right, so um, all our uh, resets in the otter, as well as our loads and reads, they're all active high. We don't have any active load. Now some, uh, and we'll get to this later, uh, some, uh, some reads in the otter are async uh, and some are synchronous. All writes are synchronous. And here in the register, uh, both our reset and our load are synchronous. Okay, there's no asynchronous. Okay. So, positive edge of the clock, if the reset is uh, high, well, we're just going to reset the output. So, here, okay, since we're in an always FF where we have memory, we use this symbol here for non blocking. Right. So you're going to assign with the non-blocking uh, the output to zero. So there's four bits. So I have four tick mark. Now I could put B and then four zeros. But just to be a little different here, I'm going to use hex. So I'm going to put an H. And then we said earlier, how many bits do I need for one hex character? Four, right? I can remember 32 bits, every four bits is a hex character. So you need eight hex characters for 32 bits. Well, if I only have four bits, that's one hex character. So I would just put one zero there. Okay. And then the next thing is I go else if load, right? So if load is active, right? Reset's not active, but load is active. Well, then out's going to be assigned to whatever I call the input. Okay, then I'm just going to go right ending this and then also ending the module. Now, you may remember from your 133 that if statements can have zero else ifs or as many else ifs as you want. But if I leave out an else, see how I didn't use an else here? Uh, no else. Why did I leave the else out? Because I did that intentionally. Why did I do that? Right, that creates the lapse. That creates the memory. Okay, so by not having an else in your if statement, that creates the storage. So you see, if it's not resetting, it's not loading, it's storing. Okay. See, if you had an if statement for your mux, 
and you left out the else in your if statement for the must, that would create a latch you don't want, right? Because a must is not sequential. A register is sequential, it has no read. So that's how we create the latch is by leaving the else out. See, that's why Bobato always warns you if there's a latch, because they want to make sure you didn't accidentally just forget the else when you shouldn't have it. Right? See, that's why it's a warning instead of an error. Okay. Okay, so any questions up to this point? So any sequential logic we're still trying to eliminate all the matches? No, a sequential circuit you want to latch because sequential circuits have memory. And that's how you create the memory is by what when you use an if statement, you create the memory by leaving out the else. If it's a combinational circuit like a must, so anything without a clock, you don't want to latch. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so that's all the 133 stuff that you need for this assignment. But before I get to the, the second hardware assignment. Let's talk about the program counter, because that's what you're going to be building today in either system variable log or variable log. Do you have a question? Yeah. I remember correctly. You did like a different thing. You have to have an end inside the end. In an end inside like, the. Like on the outside of the out uh, input. Well, you would need that if there's like multiple outputs. Okay. If there's only one output, you don't need it. You can just do it like this. But yeah, like if you had more than one output, you'd have to do that. You need a begin and end. Right. Yeah, like a begin and end like here. So when you're saying four uh, dash H zero, is the number at the beginning always the number of bits you could represent that number with? Right. Yeah, and that's yeah, this is a good question here because it's a common error and it's actually something I always used to make mistakes on, is that this number is the number of bits, it's not like the number of characters. You know, there's only one hex character here, but it's still four bits. So this number is the bits. Just like here, when you use a decimal, there's only one digit, but you got to put a two here because it's two bits. Yeah. Yeah, I, I make that mistake all the time. <laughs> all right, any other questions? All right, now I talked about this last week. Okay, so this is CP233 review. And that's the purpose of the program counter. Like, what is the reason for this program counter? What are we getting at the output of this program counter? Address. Address of what? Does anyone know the address? What is an address? It's of the next word. Well, the next word that's specifically what? <laughs> Instruction. There it is. Yeah. The purpose of the program counter is that it provides the address of the instruction to be executed. See, the output of this program counter that has the address of the next instruction, it goes to the input, this address one input of memory. And we talked about memory last week, right? The memory module, it has the different segments of the otter memory, right? It's got the code segment, the data segment, uh, the stack segment, and specifically the code segments, that's where the instructions are. And that's in the program, which is like a subset of, of the memory. Okay, so the program counter is providing the address of the instruction to be executed to memory. And then at the output of memory is going to be the instruction. And that instruction goes to the reg file. And next Tuesday, you're going to build this. And then the reg file, the output of that goes to the ALU. And that's when the instruction you know, starts to get executed. Okay. But today, we're just focusing on this. That's the question. Do you have a question? Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. So when if we ever have to like connect multiple modules in the computer, is that like going to be modeled in uh, Verilog? Yeah, I'll I'll talk about that when we get to the actual assignment. But the quick answer is yes. 
Okay, so let's look at what we have here. Uh, we have a mux. So this mux, uh, when you model in Verilog, it's going to be code very similar to what we did in that example over there. And this mux has six inputs. Right, one input is coming from this plus four block that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, it's got another input uh, that's coming from another circuit. In fact, if you look at if you look at the diagram that you can have on your bench of the Otter hardware, there's this thing called the branch address generator. The output of that is what's going to the JALR input of the MOX and the branch and the JAL. And in a future class, we'll talk about um, that branch address generator. Next class, this Thursday, we're going to talk about how you branch in software in assembly language. Okay. But you see, you got these. Um, Inputs here that have to do with jumps and branches. Then you have these two inputs, uh, this MT VEC and MEPC. Those have to do with something called an interrupt, okay, which we may or may not get to at the end of the quarter since we lost two classes. I don't know if we're going to get to uh, interrupt, but that's what these things are for. But for this assignment that you're doing today, you're just treating these inputs to the MUX as any other input, okay? You don't have to know in detail what these are yet. You'll you'll learn that later on. Right now, you're just treating these as you know inputs going into the mux. Um, like any mux, you're only getting one of them out. And what's deciding which one you get out is this PC source. Okay, this is PC source. Uh, that's what's connected to your select lines. So the PC source determines which input of the mux gets connected to this output that goes to the input of this program counter. And this program counter is a register. So the code that you're going to use to model the program counter is going to look a lot like what we did here. Okay. Now look at that diagram, that otter diagram that you have on the bench. And can you tell me where else you see PC source? Okay, there's PC source here connected to the select line of this mux, but there's also PC source somewhere else. C U G C D R. Right, exactly. CU, ECDR stands for Control Unit Decoder. And in fact, how many MUXs are in that Otter hardware diagram? You know, we got the one here, but how many other MUXs are there? There's four total. Yeah, there's like four or five. Aren't they? Because there's one by the program counter, there's a couple by the ALU, there's one by the mo uh, memory module, and then if you look the ALU, and you're gonna you're gonna build the ALU in a few weeks, but what you're gonna see when we get to building the ALU, the ALU is just a big mux. It's just gonna be a big mux. I think it's got like ten inputs. And if you look at the other outputs of the control unit decoder. All those outputs go to select lines of muxes, right? Like PC source goes to the select line of this mux where the uh, program counter is. And then there's like what? There's like ALU fun, I think it is. Yeah, ALU fun is a select line for the ALU, which is going to be a big mux. Uh, AL source A goes to a mux at the input of the ALU. ALU source B goes to a mux uh, by the input of another. Uh, ALU input, and then there's this RFWR select that goes to a mux that's um, right where the reg file is. So you see that control unit decoder is controlling the muxes, which is going to control what inputs go to the output of those mux. Okay. Um, look at this PC right now. Like we said earlier, load is just like right. So this is like a load to a register. This PC right. Where do you see the PC write on that diagram? Where else do you see it? Uh, the finite state machine. Say that again? The finite state machine. Exactly. The control unit FSM, which you know what an FSM is from 133, right? Finite state machine. And in fact, if you look at the other outputs of the finite state machine, they're mostly reads and writes. Okay? So, the control unit is made out of an FSM and a decoder. 
And the outputs of that control unit go to the select lines and the muxes, and it goes to reads and writes of all the different modules. And the reason that's called the control unit is because through the muxes, right, through the select line to the muxes, and also through the read and writes, the control unit controls how the data flows through the rest of the circuitry. Okay, that control unit, that's the last thing you build. You know, that's going to be like after the midterm. Okay, that's when you actually uh, get to see how the hardware and the instructions really intertwine. Okay, all right, so now. We've got this block, this plus four. And this plus four is connected between the output, right, where the address of the instruction to be executed is at, and one of the inputs of the MUX. Okay, in fact, it's the top input that we have labeled zero here. Why do you suppose this is plus four? That's where the next address is. The next address of what? Of the instruction. Right, exactly. See, remember that we talked about this last week, that memory for the otter is, a, is arranged in 32-bit words that are byte addressable. And instructions are 32 bits. So each instruction in the code segment of memory that's in the program is separated by four, right? Your first instructions at address zero, your second is at address four, your third instructions at address eight, fourth instruction at address 12, which is C and X and so on. So you see, after an instruction is executed, if the program is being executed sequentially, well, you gotta increment your address by four because that's where the next instruction is, okay? So you see, that's why this is called a counter, right? Because after each instruction has been executed, we increment the output by four. Right? And that's what counters are, right? They increment by a certain amount in binary. Now, you have these other inputs to the MUX, right? Besides this, you know, whatever this output is plus four. And what does J stand for? Because you saw a JA, a JAL command in the previous assignment that was part of uh, hardware number one, right? What kind of instruction is JAL? What does the J stand for? Jump. And then next class, this Thursday, you're going to learn about branching in software. So you'll see in assembly that there's branches, which are conditional jumps. Right? Branches are conditional jumps. A jump is an unconditional branch. Okay, But they're there because if you want to not go sequentially through a program, right? you want to move around in a non-sequential order, either backwards or forwards, that's where jumps and branches come in. And these jump and branches, they offset what the address is going into the program counter, which is going to make the address of the next instruction not sequential, right? Okay? So, you know, all this stuff about the jump and branches isn't, isn't something you necessarily need to know at this point, okay? But I'm just going over it so you can get a bigger picture of, of kind of where we're headed. For hardware number two assignment, you just got to build this. This is a register. This plus four makes it into a counter. This is a mux. Okay. So hardware two, okay, your, your assignment for today, let's do this Friday, is building this in either Verilog or system Verilog. Now, like I said before, the grading criteria is on Canvas and you know, hardware number one had a different criteria than all the other hardwares. But starting with hardware two, what's on Canvas for the grading criteria? That's what you want to submit. Let me just finish this and I'll answer your question. What's that? Oh, oh, turn the camera. Thank you. Yeah, I always forget to turn it. Thank you. There we go. So yeah, the grading criteria is on Canvas. And, you know, just off the top of my head, but actually look at it, okay, because I could miss some things here. But off the top of my head, what I remember is the grading criteria for the hardware is that, um, let's see, you have to provide the elaborated uh, design schematic, right, showing hopefully that what you modeled in code looks something like what you intended, like this. 
Also, you have to show any warnings that you got. There should be no errors. And also you need to show warnings. And you know, if you got a warning that says anything about a latch, right? And you didn't intend for a latch, you know, you gotta get rid of that. Um, and then there's like another block where you gotta list your test cases and show on the simulation, a simulation timing diagram that it's working the way you expected. And again, test cases show all the functionality and also fringe cases. And then I think the last thing is you show your code, okay, your um, either Verilog or system Verilog code. And there you want to make sure you have sufficient comments. Okay, I told the graders this quarter to really keep an eye out and make sure people are commenting their code. You know, it should be commented enough where, you know, if you go look at it at a later time, like in a few weeks, you still know what you're doing or what you did. For Harbor One, was it okay if we didn't do too many comments because we didn't understand what the code was? We just had to decode it. Hardware number one, that was the one passed in last night, right? Um, that was different. I was there any code that was required because didn't I have like table? And then what did I have? I had a hex listing, then I had timing diagram. There was no code for that one. What was that? Yeah, that was in the table. Yeah, that was in the table. Yeah, the, the grading criteria for the hardware number one was different than what was on Canvas, right? I, I put it on the board, but whatever I put there, that was what was expected. I don't think I had anything with comments. Okay, but getting back to this. Okay, there's basically two approaches to modeling this. One approach is to use a structural model. now. In my 133 classes, I really emphasize structural model, okay? But other instructors, from what I understand, they didn't necessarily do so. So, you know, if you wanna do a structural model, you would have a MUX design source. So you basically would have a design source where the code looks a lot like this. And you would also have a separate, an additional separate design source for the register, which is gonna look a lot like this. And then you're going to have a third design source, okay, that's what we call the top, that's going to connect these lower level modules together. Okay, so the connections are done in this module here that I labeled uh, PC. Now recall that in your top module, when you're making the connections, when you're connecting lower level modules together, like you're connecting a lower level module output to a lower level module input, okay? you need internal signals. Does everybody remember that? Like in system Verilog, you put like logic and then you put the name. So in this diagram right here, how many internal signals would I need? Okay, where would you put that one? Um, somewhere in the statements between well, I mean, in the diagram here, where would you like label that internal signal? Between like PC and an output of MUX. Okay, so yeah, that would be, now I'm gonna use, you know, just P1, but again, you're gonna be more descriptive, right? Like you might make it MUX out underscore PC in or something like that to make it more descriptive. But yeah, we would need an internal signal here because we're connecting the output of this lower level MUX to the input of this low level register. Do not need another for the output to the zero for MUX? Um, the output, well, output here? The yeah. yeah, here we would. That would be like P2 because that's going from, you know, this block that we're calling plus four to this input of the MUX. Do we need one here for this connection from this output to this side of this? Plus four block. We don't need it. Why don't we need it? What's that? Output. Yeah, because this PC out, that's a main output. Right? If you have a main output or a main input, it doesn't require an internal signal. It's an internal signal is only required when you're connecting two low level like inputs outputs together. Okay, so you would only need two internal signals here. Um, now to model the plus four, right? This increment plus four, we don't want you to 
design a ripple carry adder like you did in 133, like made out of you know multiple adders and all that. We don't want you to do that. We want you to use the software. So to do the plus four, to model the plus four in your top module where you're making the connection, just use a single assigned statement. <coughs> Whatever you call this, right? Whatever internal signal name you give this, it's just going to be this is equal to whatever you call this output plus four, right? It's going to be just like this, just one single line assigned statement. And then the software will come up with what kind of adding circuit it needs in order to get that plus four. Okay, so you're letting the software do the adder. Okay. All right. And then, uh, like I said, this would be if you do the structural model. Now, as I said, some instructors in 133, they don't stress a structural model. So some of you may have just done everything in one module. And if you want to do that, that's okay. okay if that's what you learned in 133. I happen to like the structural model. I mean, eventually you're going to have to do a structural model when you do the final order diagram, right? When you put this all together, like one of the last assignments, hardware assignments, is doing the structural model for this because you're not going to put this all in one module because <laughs> you'll never be able to troubleshoot it. See, that's an advantage to the structural model. It's easier to troubleshoot. Because I can send these individually to see if they're working by themselves before I send them together. Where if you do everything in one module, you can only send that one module. And if it's not working, well, you can't really split it up. Okay. But like I said, if you want to do one module, in fact, I did this both ways. Even though I like this, I, I did this just for some practice because I know some students will do it that way. Um, but you know, if you do one module, you still got to declare inputs and outputs and internal signals. It's just your MUX code and your register code would be all in the same uh, file. And then you would use assigned statements uh, for your internal signals. Okay. All right. So with this, you should have enough information now to, to work on uh, assignment two. Okay. Question? Yeah. So when, when you're like, should I put this in a separate project file that 